Hi, I'm Louis Giglio, and I'm glad you've joined me for this journey into one of life's most pressing and important questions. Who is Jesus? Who is this man, executed by the state, betrayed by his own disciple, nailed to a piece of wood and hung out to die? The symbol of whose death has become an icon that people display on buildings, attach to their necklaces, tattoo on their arms, and sing about in nearly every language. Who is this rabbi whose teachings are banned by various countries around the world? Who is this man who has split history in two? Think about that. Our entire modern world keeps track of the years and centuries based on his life. The life of one homeless man in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. If nothing else, he's worth investigating for that reason alone. Who is this Jesus? Napoleon considered him more powerful than any emperor who has ever lived on earth. Vincent van Gogh called him an artist greater than all other artists. Gandhi said he was the penultimate example of nonviolent resistance. Martin Luther King Jr. posited that Jesus was executed because he was an extremist for love, truth, and goodness. Albert Einstein said that Jesus was more than a myth. He was undoubtedly a real person. History is overflowing with declarations, objections, arguments, and opinions about this one central question. Who is Jesus? I'm convinced that the journey we're about to embark on has something important in it for everyone. Perhaps you're new to this conversation and you're wondering, why are there more than two billion people on the planet who claim to follow this man? What is so special about him? Or maybe you're one of those followers. Perhaps you've trusted in Jesus since you were a child, but you've never really understood all the historical aspects of his life. Or maybe you've heard all about this man named Jesus, but it just doesn't add up for you. You might be wrestling with questions like, was Jesus a good man or was he God? Is he a friend to us or a foe? Is this Jesus a king over all things or just a pawn passively watching history go by? Is he merely a way to eternal life or is Jesus the way, the only way? And paradoxically, is he a lion or is he a lamb? It's understandable for all of us that we might be holding on tightly to what we've heard about Jesus in the past. My prayer today is that you will open your mind and consider the person of Jesus. Who you find just might change your life. Welcome to session one of Who is Jesus? So a few years ago, we were doing a few world tour events and we were in London. Uh, we didn't want to do fast food and so we thought, sushi sounds good. So we ended up at the top of this building having an amazing meal. There were about maybe 10 of us at a round booth at the top of this building and somewhere about maybe halfway into the meal, uh, someone said, don't look now, but at the booth adjoining ours, this other circular booth where the backs of the booths actually touched each other, don't look now, but in that other booth is, and then they named a very well-known celebrity, an actor, an actress. I never know the difference between actor and actress, so an, a, a female actor, how about that? <laughs> I, in time and over history, had, had really appreciated the body of work for this particular actor, actress, and so I was wanting to know for sure if it was her or not, and so I did what you would do. I excused myself from the table, did a lap around to the restroom, <laughs> came back around their table so that I could get a full-on bird's-eye view. Now, I was playing it as cool as cool can be, but I'm sure if you replay the tape, I was stalking and staring and being really <laughs> awkward. And so I came back to the table, but the, the problem was I was unconvinced. And so I sent out another spy to investigate the <laughs> land, and I said, you go. And so I'm guessing over the next 20 to 30 minutes, every one of us at our table went to the restroom. There is still some division among our team, even to this day, as to the veracity of the identity 
of this person? I'm going with yes, but a lot of people still say maybe, and there's a couple of people who are convinced, no, it wasn't her. So on a more important note today, and I know you're like, well, you're not going to move on and not tell us who it was, because if you do that, we're going to leave, and then you can just share this with yourself, the rest of this, whatever else it is that you have. But we'll leave that for now and move to a more central question, which is, who is Jesus? This question has been asked forever, and what we typically do is we make a few laps around, we try to get a better angle, we triangulate with different information, and we come up and formulate our own views and opinions as to, is it really him? Is he really who he says he is? Is he really the most important person in history? Is he really someone who deserves our respect, our admiration, or more than that, is he someone that deserves our worship? Who is Jesus? Who is this man? We've seen him, we think we may know who he is, we've got a glimpse of him. Some are more convinced than others, and maybe even in the room today, there is a mixture of opinion. I'm sold, it's him. He's who he says he is. Others saying, I don't know. I'm still discovering and uncovering. Others saying, I don't think it's him. I don't really think he is who he says he is. Maybe the most important question of all is the one we're gonna end with today, and it's the one that Jesus poses in the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter. And it says in verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, Now, that's a place, a real place in northern Israel, uh, near the Golan Heights, if you've heard of that, on the steps of Mount Hermon, there is a real place named Caesarea Philippi. It has a different name, and depending on which context of history that you find it in. But when he came to this place, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, this is classic Jesus. He answers the question in the question. So who do people say the Son of Man is? I'm telling you, he's the Son of Man. That's one of the things he is. But who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist wasn't with us at this time, but maybe others thought he had come back from the dead or the spirit of John the Baptist was alive again and it was this same person as Jesus, the Son of Man. Others say Elijah, one of the prophets of old, Still others, Jeremiah or another of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say that I am? I want us to start at the beginning, not in the pages of Scripture, but I want to ask the question from a historical point of view, is Jesus real or is he a hoax? This would be stepping back from uh, the narrative of the gospel, stepping back from uh, uh, the stories about Jesus, the movies that we've seen, the Sunday school lessons that we've all learned and heard, stepping outside of the church and asking a broader question today, because this is the beginning question. Is Jesus real? Is he a real historical person, or is he a fable created by people so that then uh, They could upload a religion into the great stories of religious life on earth. So is he real in history? Well, let me bring in a couple of commentators that will help us in this way. And let's look to the historians of the day of Jesus. One of them is Tacitus, who was on the scene after the death of Christ from 56 to 120. He was a Roman senator. He was a governor of the province, which would now be Turkey, And he was one of the most well-known historians of ancient Rome. He writes that Nero blamed, quote, a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. He goes on to explain that Christ, from whom the name had its origin, the name of these Christians, suffered the extreme penalty, which was crucifixion, during the reign of Tiberius at the hand of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, that would be the resurrection, thus checked for the moment 
again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Suetonius, who was an overseer of the libraries of Rome and a court official to many emperors, writes about the emperor Claudius, that he, quote, banished the Jews from Rome who were continually making disturbances, Christ being their leader. Now, interestingly about this comment from Suetonius is it's verified and it actually amplifies what we find in Acts 18.2, where we read about how the Jews, the believing Jews, were banished from Rome by this very same emperor. Pliny the Younger, a Roman legate, also who had influence in the area which is now Turkey in the second century, wrote to the emperor Trajan. So, so far now we have three historians writing about three different emperors in the Roman Empire, and Pliny says this as he writes requesting advice on how to deal with Christians who refuse to worship Caesar's image. Pliny noted that these Christians met regularly and they sang hymns to Christ as if to a God. And then you come to Flavius Josephus. Josephus was the best known Jewish historian in the time of Christ. And Josephus writes in the Antiquities of the Jews around 90 or 95 AD, this most powerful and extensive quote. He says, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful Works. Now, can I just back up and remind us again, these words we're reading were written in 90 AD. So this isn't the latest devotional that just got published. This is ancient Jewish history. He goes on to say, he was a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He won over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles, he was the Christ, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. So when we step back and ask the question, is Jesus real? Does he appear on the landscape of history? Or is he some sort of a concoction of men and women who wanted to create a religion that they could perpetuate through life? We see very clearly that Jesus is real. He's historical. So we settle that pretty easily and you can do your own research, but to say that Jesus is a figment of our imagination or a myth is not intelligent. He appears on the landscape of history. So we've established that, and we're getting closer to the answer to our question, but it brings us to a second, more focused question, which is, who then is this Jesus of history? Well, for that, we have eyewitness testimony and in the eyewitness testimony, primarily of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we can hear Jesus answer for himself. In John chapter 10, one notable passage. Jesus answered and said, I give them, verse 28, eternal life, and they shall never perish, should be even an amen there, even though we've got our thinking uh, brains on today, still should be a, a good spiritual heart felt amen right there, so I'll come again. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. All is going well up to this point until verse 30. I and the Father are one. Now, it went sideways. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, 
I've shown you many good works from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? Verse 33, we're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So if you ask Jesus, who is the Jesus of history? Who is it that Suetonius and Tacitus and Pliny the Younger and Josephus wrote about? He would say, I am God. So if he claimed to be God and he wasn't in fact God, then he was either a liar or a lunatic. But you can't say, well, I don't believe he's God, but I do believe he was a really, really amazing person. I don't believe he's God, but he's one of the greatest moral leaders who've ever set foot on planet Earth. And I have a lot of respect for him and a lot of admiration for what Jesus did. You can't have it both ways because he didn't leave us the opportunity of just saying, I don't believe in all that son of God, son of man stuff, but wow, amazing moral leader. Jesus wasn't crucified for being a good man. He was crucified because he claimed to be God. And when he had a chance to recant at the end, to say, hey, it was all a joke, it was all a hoax, I'm just a little crazy, uh, don't drive the nails in my hands and don't drive the spikes in my feet, he didn't recant, he didn't back up. He said, it is as you say it is. I am, in fact, a king. And more than the king of the Jews, I am the king of all kings. And so in history, we see Jesus on the landscape. When we ask the question, who is the Jesus of history? We have to let Jesus speak for himself, and then we have to wrestle with his claims. And that is what all humanity ultimately has the privilege of doing, of investigating the teachings of Jesus. And so back to Caesarea Philippi, just for a moment as we close. So in Matthew 16, Jesus and his followers end up at this very significant place. The God of Caesarea Philippi was the God Pan, or even to this day, most people in Greek mythology would believe is the God Pan. And if you know much about Pan, he's an interesting uh, God. Uh, Pan is the God in Greek mythology of the wild. He is the God of the shepherds and the flocks. So at Caesarea Philippi is the cave of Pan. Inside of the cave of Pan is what was believed to be a bottomless well, a mysterious and foreboding place where the water was so deep, men and women thought it had no end. And at this place, this historical, significant zenith of pagan worship, Jesus decides, this is the place I wanna clarify who I am in the world. And standing there, surveying the situation, understanding the moment, he looked to his followers and he said, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they quickly came with the answers because people were, were talking. This guy was doing miracles. This guy was walking on water. This guy was calming the storm. This man was feeding 5,000. This man was healing the sick. This man was raising the dead. And they said, man, you know, there's a lot of opinion out there. Some people think John the Baptist has come back to life, and that's who you are. Some people think it's Elijah because, you know, Elijah could call down fire from heaven. He had supernatural power to cause miracles to happen, and people think, maybe you're him. Come back to the world. And Jesus, after getting all the thoughts from all of the disciples and his followers, he just turned things so gently. And I can imagine him being so calm and just looking and listening and, Elijah, not bad, he was, he was cool. but who do you say I am? And that's the place we wanna come around over the next few weeks. 
without assuming a simple, regurgitated, my grandmother said, answer. But so that you can allow that question to rest on your heart, and then you can formulate your answer. I love how when the question was posed, we know from our biblical history that the most anxious and aggressive and confident of all of Jesus' followers was Peter, and Peter speaks up. And this is what he said, verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Messiah. That's the one promised by all the prophets. The one Jeremiah was talking about is who you are. The one all the prophets foretold, you're the one. The one Elijah was looking to, you are him. The one John the Baptist came saying, prepare the way of the Lord. How did he know it? How did he know it? I love it. This is how he knew it. Jesus, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. When your dad gets in the phrase, you've done good. (laughs) For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, Simon. Big shift happened in the purpose and the plan and the possibility of Peter's life when he realized that he believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. His place in the story changed based on the answer to that question. You're Peter. Just stay with me just a second. And on this rock, I will build, have you heard this verse before? My church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he warned all of them and said, don't tell anybody yet that I'm the Christ. I'll let them know when I'm ready to let them know. But I'm glad that you know. Listen to this. Jesus said it wasn't simply by a work of man. It was my Father who revealed this to you. What does that mean? It means that we can investigate and I hope that you will. But investigation at some point meets revelation. Investigation is using our mind. Revelation is when God opens the eyes of our heart. And a powerhouse believer is one who's used his mind and had his eyes opened by God so that he understands the things of the world, but he has come to know the reality of Christ. And then let me just finish this. Man, so amazing. The worshipers of Pan would take sacrifices into the cave and throw them into the water. And the reason why they were terrified was because the current was such that it would suck the sacrifices down and they would never come up again. They would disappear in the depths. And in the cave of Pan, In this perceived to be bottomless well, the followers of Pan in the mythology of Greek would say, down there are the gates of hell. Down there. (laughs) And Jesus said, good answer, Peter. On this rock, the rock of me and the rock of people who believe in me. I'm gonna build a church. And don't you worry about the gates of hell in the cave of Pan. Don't you worry about what goes down in the current, down into the waters of the cave of Pan. And don't you fear anything the darkness can come against you with because the gates of hell in the cave of Pan (laughs) and anywhere else are not going to prevail against the church that I'm gonna build. And here we are. Here we are, 2,000 years later, (laughs) and what are we doing? We're building up the church that Jesus promised to Peter, and we're building it up on our minds, investigating, 
so that we can know for sure our Jesus appeared on the landscape of history. Doing our philosophical and logical work so that we know we can't just call him a moral leader, but ultimately coming around in our own lives to ask God, will you give me the revelation I need to partner with the investigation that I've done so that I can come to know for sure that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God.